Welcome to Stream of Conscience, brought to you by Democracy for America, Fairfield County, where we believe that change is possible and you can make it happen. I'm your host, John Hartwell. Our guest today is Eric Williams, founder and executive director of Connecticut Normal, the national organization to reform marijuana laws, whose mission is to move public opinion sufficiently to achieve the repeal of marijuana prohibition so that the responsible use of cannabis by adults is no longer subject to penalty. Eric has been working on reforming marijuana laws since college. In December 2011, he was named National Freedom Fighter of the Month by Normal and High Times. And last September, he was the featured speaker at Boston's Freedom Rally, an annual event held on Boston Common with 50,000 plus people. We've asked him here today to talk about the renewed push in the current legislative session to legalize medical marijuana. Eric, welcome back to Stream of Conscience. Thanks for having me again. So medical marijuana is yet again on the agenda at the legislature. Yes, uh, it is. And last year, last session, it was there. And at that time, there was a poll that was published that showed that somewhere around 78, 79% of the people in Connecticut, including the vast majority of Republicans, yep. favor medical marijuana. That's yet, true. Yet it failed once again. What happened? Well, first of all, I, I like to say that the only place where it seems that medical marijuana is controversial is at the state capitol. And, and your poll uh, clearly states that. Uh, and, and in fact, even if you look at the notion of legalizing, medical, uh, legalizing marijuana just in and of itself, that has very high poll numbers. But that's not what we're looking for. We're looking for uh, legalization of medical marijuana. Why didn't it happen last year? Well, there's a lot of theories as to why exactly it didn't happen. But the bottom line is it's a very complicated issue. Uh, needing a complicated bill. Uh, there's a lot of education that needs to happen for legislators. And uh, we got it through the committee process. It got to the uh, uh, Senate calendar. And they simply ran out of time on the Senate calendar to get it through. Uh, but clearly, we had the votes. If it was called, it uh, would have passed with Republican and Democratic support. And if it had made its way to the House, we had overwhelming uh, support there as well. So exactly what is being asked for what does medical marijuana mean in the state of Connecticut what was it what did the bill look like well the bill that uh, what they were hoping for was a sort of strike was a strike all amendment so there was language that was being worked on uh, um, for an amendment that would come out uh, um, on the floor of the Senate uh, and in that bill there were such things as having uh, specific diseases illness ailments uh, named um, and then a panel of doctors uh, that could evaluate future uh, concerns and see if they could add any other uh, um, debilitating illnesses to the list. Um, it defined uh, uh, patients and what they would have to do. They'd have a relationship with a doctor, have to be recommended uh, for medical cannabis. They would also have to register with the state. Uh, and there would be licensed uh, growers and dispensers um, that would have very, uh, uh, very strict security, uh, need for tracking uh, marijuana from seed to, uh, to sale. Um, and standardization, testing, those are the kinds of things that weren't necessarily in the bill, but uh, being a year later, I think we've learned from it, and so there are, so there are certain things we would like to see put in it, but that's essentially what was in the bill. Is there any one state out there that has a system that this Connecticut uh, system would match up against? The closest would be Colorado. Uh, Colorado has done some absolutely amazing things, but their biggest mistake within Colorado was that it became the law before there was actually any regulation put into place. Uh, so essentially the government was playing catch up all along the way. Now they did a really good job of doing that, but it, uh, if they, we have a great opportunity now to learn from what they uh, did right, what they did wrong, and to come out with what, is, uh, what will clearly be the best medical marijuana legislation in the country. But closest to emulate would be Colorado right now. Now, I understand that there are some 16 states plus the District of Columbia that have some form of medical marijuana now. That's correct. And what's been the general um, experience of those states? 
Well, again, they had to start uh, in very different places than where Connecticut's starting now. Uh, some were done by ballot measure, uh, uh, others were passed without any real mechanism in place, and some of them were passed without any uh, real understanding of the industry of the needs of patients. So we have a lot of states that actually haven't implemented their medical cannabis laws, uh, others that have been tweaking it left and right, uh, and others that are just simply not really providing the access to medicine for patients that they really should in, in, uh, in following the law. So where is it running really well? Again, I'd look to Colorado. Colorado. Certainly, certainly. They're just doing such a great job there. Uh, they've got uh, fantastic uh, patient advocacy. Uh, there are really just being pillars of the community, uh, the dispensaries and the growers. It's turning around so many uh, blighted neighborhoods and communities. Um, it's pumping tons how, of how jobs. How do you mean turning blighted neighborhoods around? What does that mean? Well, what they're doing is they're taking, uh, um, it's essentially inserting an entire industry into uh, an existing economic structure. So with that, if you're adding a whole bunch of jobs, you're adding new businesses, that's going to help a lot of the communities. And so you found, uh, it's, it's in general as opposed to just with medical cannabis, but there's also facilities that are needed there. It's not just a store opening up. There's the need for a safe, secure, state-of-the-art grow facility. There's needs for, uh, uh, for, far, uh, for uh, uh, for laboratories to test things, then there's the need for dispensers. So what we're doing is just seeing more of an economic boom that's, and they've gone to uh, great lengths to be really socially responsible in other ways besides medical cannabis. And that means doing uh, really smart urban growth. That means going into abandoned places and rehabilitating them and using those uh, facilities. So that's how they've specifically helped a lot of uh, communities. So this is all being done at the state level, but of course there are national laws which uh, class marijuana as a, a schedule one schedule one narcotic, mm -hmm. um, and it's basically completely illegal anywhere in the country according to the federal government. So how do you square that? Well, you're absolutely right. It's still a schedule one drug. Now I, I don't want to get too much into the details of uh, why exactly it is. There's a you know it's you really got agencies like the DEA. Um, making those kind of judgments. They say uh, things like there's absolutely no medicinal value on the federal level, yet the federal government has been supplying medical marijuana to four patients in particular uh, for decades now. Uh, so there's also a lot of really good science that's coming out of individual states, and essentially we've got states' rights here where, pe where the federal government is saying, look, if you've got a medical marijuana law and it's, it's sufficient in terms of security, in terms of safety, in terms of uh, standardization, uh, and there's strict rules and regulations. And if there are companies and individuals, businesses, growers, whatever, if they are following all state laws and all local laws strictly, then the federal government leaves them alone. Uh, there is yet to be a single raid on a grower, a patient, or a dispensary uh, of where they are operate where they are operating under state and local laws completely. There's yet to be that. So, uh, you know, there's what the federal government has on, on its books, and then there's, of course, what their actions are going to be. And we've also seen some very uh, clear guidelines that have come out um, from the Department of Justice uh, saying what they expect uh, uh, federal, uh, federal prosecutorial dollars to be going towards. And in that, we see that there's room for, uh, uh, for patients and, uh, to get the access to the medicine they need, again, under strict guidelines uh, by the state and following all state and local laws. So uh, one of the major opponents of this uh, in Connecticut is State Senator Tony Boucher mm -hmm. uh, from Wilton. And I know that she has uh, argued strenuously against passage of medical marijuana, any kind of reform of, of marijuana laws. And she's made some points which uh, I just wanted to throw out and see what sure. you have to say. So one of the things that she says is that um, medical groups such as the American Medical Association and the Connecticut State Medical Society don't embrace the idea of medical marijuana. Well, frankly, that's not true. We've actually seen that the uh, American Medical Society has actually uh, um, said that there are uh, palliative benefits um, to medical cannabis. Uh, and of course, there's a, a, a quite a few state medical societies who have done so as well. Uh, I look at the Connecticut Medical, Medical Society. I hope that they will come along uh, and endorse this proposal. Um, there are quite a few doctors in the state who are firm believers in this. So we know that there is a grassroots swell 
from within the doctors' organizations. But also, again, this takes time, and uh, it's 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 something that the doctors followed for years and years to look through the, the FDA process, uh, the more process-oriented. And so we look to them to say, look, we understand that there's research needed, uh, but we also see that there's an awful lot of benefits for a lot of people, and they're the people who are on the front lines. The doctors are the people who are speaking with their patients. And those are the ones who should be making the medical decisions, the doctors with the patients, and not the legislature. So you mentioned before that there were some uh some specific illnesses that you think that this is appropriate for. What are these? Well, what I think they're appropriate for and uh, what's in the bill are completely different things. There's, there are an awful lot of benefits. Uh, I can't name them all off the top of my head, but of course there's the ones that people know about, cancer and glaucoma, uh, HIV, AIDS. There's uh, Crohn's disease, although there's a whole host of gastrointestinal uh, diseases that, that this really does fantastic work for. Uh, PTSD. Um, severe end of life, there's a huge need for having medical cannabis. But what other people are using it for are a whole host of other things. Of course, there's anxiety. Uh, there's not being able to sleep. There's the everyday aches and pains. There are quite a few uh, patients in other states who I've heard some fantastic stories where they had regular migraines. And by taking medical cannabis, they simply don't ever have migraines anymore. We've also seen treatment for Parkinson's disease, we've seen it for stroke victims, we've seen it with a, uh, with a whole host, MS as well. There's just so many great uh, uh, opportunities out there um, to find cures and to find uh, relief for patients. Now, one of the arguments that uh, Senator Boucher is making is that um, she'd be okay with this if it were only for uh, patients who are in a terminal uh, you know, with a terminal diagnosis from a disease like cancer, say, where there really isn't anything that this person can do other than uh, try to mitigate the pain that they're going through before they come to a very, you know, soon into their life. Um, and she feels that, that this is perhaps a legitimate place to put it, but that, uh, you know, people on, who are pushing for this uh, aren't willing to work with her on that. What, what do you say there? Well, right off the bat, I think that there's a lot of hypocrisy within that comment because what it's saying is that there's clearly a, a palliative benefit, that there's a, a pain relief that comes from it. Maybe it's a, a matter of dealing with their ability to handle the cancer drugs. There is clearly an admission in that, in that statement that there are benefits for it. Why do we have to wait for someone to be at the end of their life to do it? There are people who are going through cancer treatments right now that could that greatly, greatly benefit for it. So just on the cancer statement alone, it's, it's, it's fairly disingenuous that, they would, that she would say that, or any, any advocate uh, or, or opponent would say that, knowing that they're admitting some very specific uh, uh, relief that can be had by medical cannabis, and yet denying that very specific relief in other instances in life. I, 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 don't, I don't buy that as, as being, in, as being uh, genuine. So someone else who, who takes medical marijuana, uh, what's the likelihood that they're going, going to become addicted? Like other drugs, alcohol, people become addicted to alcohol, people become addicted to cigarettes. What about marijuana? Uh, marijuana has extremely, extremely low uh, percentage of people who become addicted to it. In fact, when you look at the people who are uh, self-describe themselves as, as addicted to it, it falls in line with a very uh, a whole host of other things, things like diet soda, things like caffeine. Uh, caffeine actually has higher addiction than, uh, than you get from, uh, from cannabis. Uh, but basically, we've got an awful lot of people who are looking at medical cannabis, not, not to get high, but to manage their pain, to manage the, their, their stomach or gastrointestinal issues, to manage a whole host of really serious uh, afflictions that they have at this point. So I, I just really feel that uh, uh, we need to look at the addiction part of it um, and compare that to a whole bunch of other, uh, uh, other prescription drugs that are out there. Uh, comparing it to something like the, the hard drugs or, or alcohol, it's not even close to in the same league. Cigarettes, not even close, not comparable whatsoever. But if we want to classify that uh, in a more uh, a more rational approach, we look at prescription drugs. Now, just last year, prescription drugs, accidental prescription drug deaths, surpassed uh, automobile accident deaths. Really? That, that was last year. We've got a very, very serious problem. And further, you know... Is that we, here in Connecticut or nationwide? That's nationwide. 
That's okay. the mind. And so, w when we're looking at when we're looking at those, the, the notion of addiction, of course, you know, that's something we want to take seriously. We want to make sure that patients uh, have a relationship with their doctor, that they're 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 being tracked, they're being uh, helped along the way to find out. Uh, are they getting addicted to it? I, I sincerely, again, don't think it's even possible for someone to be addicted to marijuana, but if you are going to take that argument, there are plenty of reasons still why it should be legalized. Again, the, the addiction to prescription drugs, it's a, it's a real epidemic in this country. It's only getting worse, and so many of the patients are getting off of prescription drugs by using medical cannabis. I mean, it's a whole host. People are cutting out 5, 6, 7, 10, 15 pills a day. Uh, that have to do with pain relief and and other relief that they have, and, and they're, they're replacing it by with medical cannabis. And what about this as a gateway to other drugs? Well, it, that simply doesn't play out. Uh, all the research shows that it's just uh, it's just not true. Now, people can say that uh, uh, a lot of times when people look at uh, marijuana and say that that's the first thing I tried, um, and now I'm on some other hard drug. Well, all you need to do is is ask them really what is what were the first drugs that you tried, and of course you're going to look at things like nicotine and drinking. Invariably, come up as the first drugs they tried. Now, the statistics can easily be weighed in a whole host of ways. Uh, you could say, uh, uh, for example, that everyone who's, who rides bikes has a greater instance of getting into a bike accident. Well, of course they do. But when we look at the massive, massive amount of the adult population in America who say that they've tried marijuana at some point in their life, and then we look at the various other uh, addiction rates that are out there and the usage of other hard drugs, it simply doesn't play out. It's a great sound bite. It's easy for people to understand. But when you look at the facts, it simply doesn't play out. And what about the argument that having medical marijuana available to adults is going to make it easier for children to uh, start using marijuana as, as children and in an unsupervised, non-medical situation. In other words, they're going to take the marijuana and, and you know, take it to parties, and then uh, you know, a whole host of bad things could happen. Again, it's an interesting theory, but we have data at this point, and we see that that simply doesn't play out. In fact, in, mo in a few medical marijuana states, we've seen that the teen usage of marijuana has actually decreased. And at the, in the worst case, it stayed, uh, it stayed level, but it's why not would you, Why would you think that, that, it would, that has happened? I, I don't know your statistics, but it seems counterintuitive that you put more marijuana into the society in a legal form, and you see the usage of it go down by teenagers. Well, I'll, I'll disagree with your premise that we're going to be putting more marijuana into, the, into society. I think that what we're doing is we are taking uh, the, a whole bunch of people who are using other illegal drugs, um, and they're going and using marijuana at this point, and we're making it more medicinal. And further, if, if you're, but to answer your original question about why do I think it's happened, uh, I believe it's more education. Uh, here in America, we have not been having the right conversations with our kids about drugs. Uh, we need to have real conversations and not scare tactics. You know, telling a, a high school student that if you smoke marijuana uh, one time that you're going to end up dead, that's not a, re a real conversation. Um, saying that if you try marijuana then you're going to go straight to heroin, that's not a real conversation. And I think that what we really want to see in those kinds of states uh, and what we'd like to see here in Connecticut is more education. And, and again, taking part of the illegal drug stream and turning it into a legitimate industry that's helping patients, that's one way to do it. And again, the, 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 by making this a legitimate industry as well, we're also going to see that there's a real need for continued education, uh, again, for children, for society, for parents, for schools. Uh, and not just the don't, uh, just say no. That just doesn't work anymore. Students and, and children, they want to have more information. It's available on the internet. And so having a parent spew some sort of uh, silly statistic like uh, you're going to get right on heroin if you try this, that's not realistic for them. They feel they're being lied to. And having a real conversation with children is the way to reduce adolescent drug use. So with approximately 3 million people in Connecticut, if medical marijuana is approved, how many people do you think would actually benefit? That's one. And secondly, you've talked about economic uh, value of new industries. And what, what do you think is the economic size of this, of this industry? 
Well, the, who's going to benefit? It, it, the answer to that is everyone in Connecticut. Uh, because if, by having just the jobs created, having a new industry, the new tax revenue. And how many in, people do you think would be prescribed that's a very, medical marijuana? That's a very difficult question. Um, you know, if you look at the statistics, they go from anywhere from three percent of the population to seven to nine percent of the population. We are crafting legislation that deals with very specific illnesses and ailments. Uh, you know, there could be uh, large numbers, a couple hundred thousand, who are eligible. But does that mean that they're going to use it? Uh, it's, I, I don't know. That's between them and their doctor. Uh, but I see a few thousand patients in the state. You no, know, 5% would be 150,000 people, which is um, not a small number of people. So how much, what's the economic benefit there? Got a ballpark estimate? I, I really don't. I, I've been focusing a lot on the legislation, not so much the, uh, uh, the, the, what exactly is going to be happening. Would there be with taxes involved? With I this? would hope so. I would hope so. In fact, uh, we, we've been arguing for a local tax option. Um, for people who are going to be having medical marijuana facilities in their, in their uh, uh, municipalities. Let's give them more of an incentive to work with them uh, to find out what exactly works uh, uh, for their individual community. Uh, I'd like to see, obviously, sales tax on this. There would be any kind of uh, uh, taxes or fees for uh, the licenses, the registration. Uh, yeah, I see a real big tax revenue coming into this and the jobs, uh, and that's just on the sale of the product. But when you look at things like um, uh, the statistic that every every home new home sold uh, generates uh, two and a half jobs, you know that kind of statistic happens with every industry, and it's going to happen with this as well. It's not just the growers and the dispensers; it's the buildings that they use, it's the electricians, it's the master growers and all the support staff that they have, it's the security staff, it's accountants, it's lawyers, it's the building maintenance. All these kinds of things are real jobs, and just put put everybody back to work. I think it would be one of the biggest uh, creators of jobs uh, uh, in this state in, in years. Well, it's, uh, it's definitely a very interesting uh, prospect. Um, you know, the, the change is coming, and uh, yes, it is. we'll see if, if the bill gets through this time. Uh, what do you think the prospects are? I, I think they're very good. You know, so many uh, people really, like I said, need to be educated uh, last time around, and, and a lot of them have. So we're not starting at zero where we were before. And now it's fantastic seeing the questions uh, that are being asked from legislators. It shows that they have a lot more intelligence about it. For example, last year there wasn't a lot of conversations about medibles, those being edible marijuana. And, and now we're, we're having more conversations about that. Uh, we're talking about vaporization and tinctures and creams and sprays where people aren't smoking marijuana. In fact, you know, there are very few uh, uh, instances where that would be the best method of delivery. So we're having those kinds of conversations now. We're talking about things like security. We're looking at other states like in Colorado. They've recently had uh, a group called Franwell that is doing RFID technology for tracking. That's the radio frequency ID. Right. So we can track from, from seed to sale. Uh, to really find out uh, where everything's going. So, so with all of that kind of stuff, people are asking those really great questions that, that uh, encourage me that this bill is not only going to move forward, but it's going to move forward and be the best medical marijuana model legislation in the country. Well, uh, good luck with it. And, Thank you uh, very much. Keep us, keep us informed. And I hope to come back and tell you more. I hope you can. Thank you very much. Thanks for coming in. My pleasure. America has never been more divided in our lifetimes. And 2012 is shaping up to be yet another critical year. Our Democracy for America group has defined itself as being socially progressive and fiscally conservative. But what does that mean? How, as a group, should we evaluate office holders and candidates who want our support? What do we stand for? Well, the conversation is still ongoing, but the direction is clear. We want an end to foreign wars, a return to the rule of law, a fairer financial and tax system, universal health care, a political system based on people, not money, a clean environment, and a focus on rebuilding America. Let's talk about specifics. First and foremost, we want an end to foreign wars and adventurism. The Obama administration has completed the withdrawal of combat troops from Iraq, but they left behind the largest U.S. embassy in the world, and some 15,000 heavily armed contractors, many who perform military-like missions. They need to come home, too. Next is Afghanistan, where the President has promised to have the troops out by mid-2014. Not nearly soon enough. 
This war is lost. And every day that we stay, we waste precious lives and treasure. As we pull out, we need to stop drone attacks on civilians and abandon nation building. We can't kill everyone who doesn't like us, and we can't remake the world in our image. Enough is enough. Finally, in the war making department, it's time to substantially scale back our international presence. Our military budget is larger than the rest of the world combined. We don't need 11 aircraft carrier groups, 50,000 soldiers in Germany, or 750 plus military bases around the world. We can't afford it, and it's not making us safer. The Founding Fathers would be stunned and dismayed to see what role we've adopted in the world. At home, we want to return to the rule of law. First up, repeal the Patriot Act. Get rid of secret courts. Stop targeting American citizens for assassination in foreign countries. Close Guantanamo and return all terrorist prosecutions to civilian courts. Next, end the war on drugs and stop using racially driven incarceration as a modern substitute for segregation. Our financial services system is still at risk. Over the three years after the near meltdown, we have yet to see real change that would make a repeat impossible. We need to start with reestablishing effective separation between commercial and investment banks like we had with Glass-Steagall. Next, we need to put strict limits on the size of banks so none has monopoly power or is too big to fail. Simply put, regulators must regulate and capital requirements must be large enough to protect the system. Two more reforms. Institute a financial transaction tax on trading and allow bankruptcy judges to write down mortgages. The former will produce revenue and hamper speculation, and the latter will begin to restructure the mortgage market and bring it into line with reality so people aren't trapped in houses that are underwater. There's been a lot of talk about reforming the tax code. Forget about fighting over Bush tax cuts. Let's enact fundamental change beginning with taxing all investment income equally with wages. No more special reduced rates for dividends, capital gains, and carried interest. Next, eliminate corporate loopholes. These two steps would allow lower rates for everyone, though we need to keep a strong, progressive system where the rich pay more than the middle class. Let's also push for a transformation of the health care system. Obamacare didn't go far enough with millions left uncovered and costs out of control. We must implement a single-payer Medicare for all approach with the government free to negotiate best prices from suppliers and a system built to reward health outcomes, not pay for procedures. None of this will be possible if Citizens United is allowed to stand and elections go to those who can raise the most cash. We need a constitutional amendment to overturn corporate personhood and enable limits on campaign contributions. Better still would be public financing of elections and the free use of public airways for candidates and campaigns. Finally, we need to protect the environment while rebuilding America. Finding, creating, and exploiting domestic energy sources is critical to our long-term security, but we can't simply give in to short-term needs with tar sands oil and natural gas produced by fracking. We need sustainable energy development that doesn't destroy the country in the process. Beyond energy, we have an urgent need to begin investing again in our infrastructure. The power grid is outdated. Mass transit is lacking. Our cities are crumbling, as are the roads and bridges that were built by earlier generations. And our public schools are substandard. Clearly, there's a huge amount of work ahead to put this country on the right track. Those who came before us were able to take big risks and dream big dreams. Our current political system has us trapped in thinking small if we think at all. It really is time for change we can believe in. That's our show for this week. We hope you enjoyed it. If you'd like to learn more about progressive, grassroots political action, please check out our Democracy for America group we meet the first Wednesday of the month at the Silver Star Diner in Norwalk, and we'd love to have you join us. 
Remember, change is possible, and you can make it happen. This has been Stream of Conscience, and I'm your host, John Hartwell. Thanks for watching.